What's up guys? Welcome to the channel. I'm Chris Lato. Exciting video today. This video was filmed in December, December 18th, 1.17 a.m. in the morning by Michael. Fuck. Fuck, it's gone. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. When I initially saw it, yeah, I thought it was a flashlight, like you are probably thinking it right now. But the deeper I dug into the story, and I talked to Michael, he wants to be anonymous, right? And I can understand that. I mean, look at Bob Lazar. Even if he's correct, his life has just been harassed. So I can understand it. Michael doesn't want to give away his identity, but we've confirmed his identity. We've looked at Michael's driver's license. We've done criminal background checks on him. As far as I can tell, at least his story checks out. Okay. We haven't checked in with any other family members. Okay. We haven't heard from them or the woman that was with him as well. We haven't heard from her as well. So at the end of the day, this is just a single source. Okay. It's a single source, but this is an HD video. Joe Scott's always asking, where are the HD videos? Here's your HD video. There's an HD video. The man says it's real. We'll go through it. We'll describe exactly what he's thinking, what he was feeling at the time. He's serious about it. He doesn't think it's funny. Okay, first thing, the biggest argument, all I've seen as soon as I put it on online, initially what I thought as well is it's a flashlight, right? Obviously a flashlight or some sort of laser pointing at the sensor. Except if you actually point a laser or a flashlight at a sensor, it doesn't look like that, okay? It doesn't look like that. I do hope putting this out there though will get people looking at it. Yeah, if you think it's fake, go ahead, but give me a reason, actually tell why, because looking into this, lasers don't look like that, okay? When you point them at a sensor, look at this. This is from Action Labs YouTube, an amazing YouTube channel. Check this out. Now, if you've ever looked directly at a bright colored light or used a camera to film it, you might've noticed something weird that happens. So I have here three different colored light bulbs. One's green, one's red, one's blue. Okay, so to start off, I have my aperture at 8.0 and my shutter speed at 16,000, which means I'm only letting in a little bit of light. So you can see these light bulbs look very clear, blue, red, and green. But then watch this weird thing that happens as I increase the shutter speed, meaning that I'm letting in more and more light into the camera sensor. Okay, I'm at a shutter speed of 16,000, 13,000, 10,000, 8,000. So now I'm at an aperture of 2.8. So I'm letting in a lot more light now into the sensor compared to what it was before. And you'll notice that it's really hard to tell the difference between blue, red, and green light now on screen. This should be a little concerning to you because what's weird about this is now on the camera, it's telling you that what used to be blue light is now white, and what used to be red light is now white, and what used to be green light is now white. So somehow, when lights get really bright, they all just start to look white. And if you don't believe me that these are becoming the same color, let me now increase the exposure even more. And you can see that everything now is just white. So it's just this blob of white here. I thought that video was interesting, and I'm taking you guys through my own investigative timeline. Basically heard from Michael, got an email from Michael back in the beginning of February. Michael has had two other interesting UAP type experiences, okay, that he did relate. I'm not going into detail on those cases in this video, but we will mention them. But I bring up this video in particular from Action Labs to show that if you shine a laser or a bright light into a camera sensor, 
that is going to gain out the sensor, kind of like we see at the end. Also interesting is if you have a bright enough red light even, he said there, red light is in the video, there is a bright red light. Michael said it didn't appear red actually even on the sensor, it was a bright, super bright white light. As we see there, it could be just so bright that uh, it was a red light and it appears as a white light. But he says even looking around, he had white light everywhere else. So although it looks red, this explains why it could be a white light. You also see if you pointed an actual laser or in the dark, if you were just looking at a flashlight, for instance, that's just putting light at the sensor, then it would gain out the sensor, right? You would see here, it would just gain out the sensor, just like hitting your eyes. So there would have to be some sort of filter, some sort of trickery, some optical trickery uh, involved as well. And finally, during the video, you may have seen these lens flares. It looks like kind of a matrix of three different colors. If you look here from the bright light, it's bouncing off the camera and then getting some sort of inner reflection on inside the lens. And Mick West said that this could be three lights, could be LED. So that's why he thinks it's a hoax. But actually, if you look, they're actually in a matrix, right? So they're in a matrix, and I answered this in response to the idea that the Norindu Plasma UAP is obviously an LED flashlight. If you look at the lens flare found in the video below, the matrix lens flare is most likely due to the bare filter in the sensor giving oversaturated with light. The bare filter removes light from each spectrum of the RGB to filter the right color to the, of light to the sensor. The filters are organized in a matrix of RGB. That's also mentioned in the Action Lab video shared in the description. But what you basically have is a bare filter. It looks like all sensors of light, or at least photosensors of light, detect light in general. And so any light hitting them, they will react. So how it works is the sensor... The bare filter is a mosaic color filter in an RGB format. And so if you want red in, you filter out all the other types of light, right? If you want green in, you filter all the other types of light. So that's what actually hits the sensor. But if you have a very, very bright light now, it'll bleed through and now you'll hit all of the sensors. So what we are seeing, I believe, is the bare filter over the actual sensor of this P19 Pro camera. Okay, so... It doesn't just work out. You're just pointing a flashlight at a sensor, okay? And I thought the same thing when I looked at it, okay? I thought the same thing. So investigated it initially, listened to Michael's story. is like, we need to look into this more. So we set up an interview. And so now I want to go through that interview with my assistant, Danny Overton. He's my research assistant. Thank you so much. Danny's actually the one that found this, found Michael's story and brought it to us. So I'll bring you now to that interview. Thanks again for being here. If you do like this content, smash that like button and subscribe to get more notifications when I release further videos. Go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato to support the channel. Now on to the interview. All right. Hello. I'm here with Michael. And thank you, Michael. If you can just hold up your driver's license and we can just confirm. Yeah, that's the same one we saw. Well, thanks for talking with us, Michael. That should be good. Thanks for having the courage to speak out. I know you've had some issues dealing with this and getting people to listen to you. So we're happy to listen to you. I will tell you on our side, we deal with a lot of scammers. We deal with, you know, I just made a video today about a fake video, a fake UFO video. So, you know, just bear with us as we verify and make sure everything's legit. So yeah. that's just the nature of the world. But your video is amazing from, from what we've seen so far. I guess, can we just go through and, and tell us again? You know, I know you already said it in the email, but if you want to just go through and, and, and talk through, and then we'll I'll show the video here on the side and we can talk through the video as well. Yeah, well, so I live in New South Wales. A friend and I went to central Queensland, which is 1,800 kilometers from where I am. We got to the Queensland border and our... um. We weren't staying in motels, we were just camping on the side of the road, like free camping. And after she'd gone to sleep, I stayed out in my chair and I just made a cup of tea and I'm sitting there as I normally do every night before I go to sleep. And I saw a red light just shoot across the sky and I just thought it was a, you know, like a shooting star or even a piece of, because it was red, I assumed it might have been some sort of metal coming through the atmosphere sort of thing, like a piece of satellite that had broken up but as it went over the horizon i saw it actually come back 
and it came back slower than what it shot across the sky because when it first shot across the sky it went as fast as a shooting star it just went from where i started seeing it all the way to the horizon then it came back slowly and just hovered above me and it was it was really high and as it lowered down it was hovering for a good two minutes before i got my phone out as it lowered down the lights changed from red to all different colors and then it hovered down a little bit lower and i was yelling to my friend to come out and have a look but she was sound asleep so by the time i got my phone i'm holding the phone directly above my head it was literally right over our camp and it wasn't to either side it was directly above me and as it started changing colors it sort of freaked me out because it was coming lower as it was changing colors and and i was just amazed at what i was seeing let me just stop you there. I will go through it just a little bit slower. So you are up there with your, you're traveling with a, a friend that yeah. wishes to remain anonymous, but uh, so she was there as well. And you, you happen to be outside and this is the start of the video, right? Oh, so thank you so much. You, you shared it on YouTube, at least unlisted at this point. Most people don't have the wherewithal to start videoing, you know, normally they're the stories are all okay. I didn't even think to pull out my phone seeing this crazy thing, you know, so I guess so how are you different, I guess? How are you able to, to consider to use your phone, et cetera? It, it took two minutes before I even thought about it. Like I said, it was it was hovering there for at least a minute, two minutes before I picked my phone up. And then oh, by the time gone. I got my camera activated and shining up, it, was, it would okay, have been so You saw this for a few minutes before you started videoing. At, at least a minute and a half, I would say, maybe two minutes. But... Yeah, by the time I had got the phone, the phone was just sitting in front of me on the little camp table that I had. And by the time, because I was still looking up at it while I was grabbing the phone, I'm looking down trying to start the camera. And initially I took a photo and I realized that I had to switch it to video. So when I switched it to video, that's when I started videotaping it. I could hear a noise that it was making. It was just like an electrical hum. I don't know how to explain it. It was just... A very weird hum and as it lowered down it changed color and at the very end of the video you can see just before it takes off it shone what i saw was a perfectly bright light a bright white light um, but when i looked at the video it looks red but it was a perfectly white light that was shining on me when it when it happened and the video didn't take it doesn't show the colors that I actually saw with my eyes. It just shows generic colors. The purple or the, the mauve color where it went to mauve was a color I'd never seen before. It was just, it was a weird thing to look at. But that there, what you're showing there, it's it's got a red sort of halo to it. It was bright, bright white. It was perfect white light when I saw it. And then it actually it was still lowering it was lowering the whole time till it got literally like two or three stories above me i'm guessing okay yeah because you said it just lowered down right and and you can hear that sound it sounds like an electric engine or some sort of hum from an electric motor or something is that what it sounded like in person exactly what we're hearing in there that, that hum the, the best way i describe what I heard when I was hearing it was oh, fuck. like when you turn a welder on, like an old arc welder, and when you're welding it makes a different sound, but when it's just turned on it makes a just a low humming noise. It was doing that, but the, it was changing pitch. It was going up and down in pitch. Fuck, it's gone. When it disappears at the end, I mean, you say, oh, oh fuck, it's gone. Um, I mean, did that take off quickly or? Because obviously when you stop the video, you can actually still hear the sound as it disappears off the screen on the video. It, I mean, did it just take off? It literally just took off like that. It just, it, it didn't accelerate. It just attained the speed and disappeared was going over the trees and over the horizon.
fuck, it's gone. I guess what's strange is you say it's gone, but we can still hear it, you know? I, I yeah. think that's what's kind of strange. Fuck, it's gone. I mean, what were you thinking, right? So it, this thing, it, when it comes down, it comes down very, very quickly. The whole engagement here is like a minute. You said it was a minute and a half, two minutes prior. So really just three minutes total. Yeah. So I guess if you could just, I'll just play it here with no sound. If you can just try and remember back, you know, what were you thinking at the time? What what were you feeling? How did you, how were you able to video it straight up? You know, are you looking straight up? Actually, how are you videoing it? You can just run through kind of what you were doing and, and yeah, how exactly you were doing it so we can get a better idea. Okay. Kind of put it there, if you will. Yeah, well, when it came back, like I said, it just hovered directly above me. I can't, like, it couldn't have been any more direct above me. So I'm How high you think? There. Yeah. 50 to 100 meters. I, I couldn't tell. I'm only guessing, but it was it was fairly high. And then it came down as it lowered down. Well, I'd already had the video camera out by the time it lowered down, but it just hovered up there for two or three minutes. Minute. Can you know. hold the camera how you were holding it? I'm just. I'm. Was it just straight up? It was just like that. Okay. Head. So oh. I had the camera. What I thought was aimed at it. I was looking out to the side because I was staring at it. And I just kept looking back to the camera, sitting in a camp chair, just leaning back, just okay. Above yeah, that makes head. it even better. That makes sense how you could film it. It's quite a steady film, actually. You're not moving so yeah. much, so that makes sense. You're laying down. In your when you your story, you mentioned it changes colors, and you you could actually feel the warmth, maybe even the vibrations of that. So, what, what are you thinking as this thing's lowering down over your head? Uh, I don't recall what I was thinking other than like I was yelling at my friend to wake up and <laughs> nothing happened. But then when I realized what I should do, I grabbed my phone, which was sitting right in front of me on the count on the camp table. As it started changing colors, I knew that it wasn't something that I'd seen before. I knew straight away it wasn't like an aircraft or, or a, a drone or anything like we were two, three hundred kilometers away from any town. We're out in the middle of the outback on the side of a road. There's no towns for hundreds of kilometers. So I knew it wasn't a drone and it was huge. Like it was, it was massive in size. It had to have been the size of a, a house or bigger in diameter. So it was fairly, fairly big. But when you asked what I felt, when it came down low, I felt a sort of vibration I don't know how to explain it. It felt like I was going to pass out. Oh, but it's gone. I just, it, it was a good feeling. It wasn't a bad feeling. I didn't, I just felt safe. And that's when it turned into the bright white light. And just went that's straight this up red again. Part, right? You said it was, uh, you said it was white in person, this part. Yep. When I was looking at it, it was bright white. It lit up. Where I was sitting, it lit up the the tent and the car in this just perfect, like a like a, a huge bright white spotlight was on me. Wow! And but it wasn't until out. I looked. It wasn't until I looked at the video that there was no white light. It was just red. And so, what do you remember from the actual object? You know, because from the video, really, we see that the fusion plasma or whatever that is. You know, this kind of interesting. I Oh, did you, could you see that? What, could you make any details out? Yeah, I could see the bottom of it perfectly clear. Uh, it had little, I suppose, vent looking things on it. Nothing was coming out of them, but they were just sort of overlapping. I don't know how to explain it. They were just protrusions sticking out from the bottom and had a couple of different rings and it had some markings on it that were not writing that I would recognize. The best I could describe was like some sort of foreign writing, but it was angular, not not cursive kind of thing. But it was like about maybe six or seven different characters, and they were in a arc around one of the inner rings. Yeah, I saw the inner rings you're talking about. Let me. I was trying to find a better spot here. So here it's a little, I can zoom in afterwards, but basically, yeah, well, what, what we saw looking at the videos, there's like an inner ring around this energy, whatever this is, this light source looks like a ball of plasma, right? 
And then you have another layer of rings around the outer side here with a couple different protrusions. You know, it looks like this is protruding here and this yep. is protruding here. You know, did you see different protrusions, I guess, or shape of the bottom of the craft? I saw the two that you just pointed out and around the inner ring, just on the out or the outside of the, the ring on the inside was the letters. Okay. Um, that, I've looked at the video. They don't show up on my video. But I could definitely see them with my own eyes. I see. So you saw around this inner ring, that's where you saw specific writing, et cetera. Yep. The actual fusion ball or whatever. <laughs> is that what that looked like in real person? I mean, could you look at this thing? I was staring straight at it the whole time. Didn't hurt my eyes. Everything was fine. The only thing I felt from it was when the light went bright at the end, it was it was fairly bright. And like I said, that 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 sort of area there yeah that part of the video and like i said the fainting part is it's the best i could describe but it, it wasn't like i was going to faint it was that moment you feel like you you know you the blood's rushing from your head sort of thing but it wasn't a bad feeling i didn't feel like i was just going to flop out or anything it just it was just kind of a little vibration that and it could have been just just me. And you saw all the the different colors. You said it changed all yep. the different colors to the purple and the green and the red that we saw. Yeah. Saw that. Yep. What time of night would you estimate it to be? It would have been ten ten thirty. Oh. I take it you didn't have any time loss or anything like that. Any time loss? Yeah. No, not as far as I know. Everything was, was normalized. As soon as it happened, I finished my cup of tea and I went into the tent and went to sleep. Yeah. This is that uh, the inner ring, I guess, that we were was interesting here. And then you have this, you know, this plasma ball. So based off of your what you said, it's around 30 to 40 meters, say the size of a house. Yeah, it was, it was kind of hard to tell because I couldn't judge how far away it actually was. I, I didn't realize how actually close it was until it lowered down, and then I saw how big it actually was. But when it was high up in the sky, it was just, it was just, you know, it looked like a, a drone. But as it lowered down, I could clearly see it was, it was massive. So if it's thirty meters across, I, so I measured this ball based on the size right so if the, yeah. the total craft is or this object is 30 meters across that would make this around four and a half meters so a 12 foot you know if you think of that a 12 foot plasma ball you know is kind of what i've heard reported from other people you know seeing these balls of energy looks like a sun or something yep that's what it looked like at the end. It was as bright as day when that white light hit, but it, it was bigger than the sun for sure. But yeah, it was it was a big light. And did you feel any heat from that thing? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I know I felt something. I didn't feel any wind or anything. I know that. But as for heat, it was no. I, I couldn't really say it. I felt heat from it. Excellent. So, Michael, have you had any other effects from this? Why you, I guess, is the question. Can you hear us? I have no idea why me, but yeah, I didn't tell anyone about the video for the first person I told outside of the girl was my brother. Yeah, I can hear you. So you shared you shared this with no one, right? This event me? happened. You had the video. You, you shared it with nobody. Yeah, so I didn't. I didn't tell anyone about it until I told until I told my brother. And I guess what made you share it? So why are you sharing it now? As like I said, as soon as I opened the video up and showed it to my brother, within days things were happening to me. It was. I've got a new car that's only a few years old and 
It had the same problem a few times in a row. It cost me $3,000 each time to get it fixed and they could never fix it. Um, and now it's still got problems that it, it won't run properly. And I've had two different mechanics now look at it. Out of the blue, the oil just drained out of it. My phone has been hacked. I've had my photo gallery deleted out of my phone. That's just not a big deal. But the other big deal is that all my friends in my friends list, list have been contacted, including the girl that I was with. And it was appeared to them as if it was coming from a text message from me that I didn't want to be friends with them anymore. I didn't want to associate with them. And that's kind of what really annoyed me a, a fair bit. But I've also, while I've been driving my car around and getting it fixed and repaired, I've had stupid black four-wheel drive SUVs following me very close. They had no number plates on them. One was came around, went in front of me and hit the brakes. And then they would just disappear. They would, they would take off and I'll be left with just two idiots driving like maniacs trying to run me off the road virtually or I'll have me hit them. So luckily I, I didn't have an accident. So, but it, quite a few other things have happened that are just completely out of the ordinary. Yeah. For what my life is at the moment. Okay. So you, yeah, you, so as soon as you started this video or at least showed it to your brother, you kind of noticed negative things starting to happen in your life and it, and you're happy now to, to yeah. at least sharing it, to at least get the information out. You're hoping something will change. Let's hope. I'm not sure if it will because I made the video public a couple of days ago and the night that I made it public, one of those black four wheel drives was parked out the front of the place that I'm staying at at the moment. Really? And it sat there, it just sat there right behind my car where my car was parked on the road and I was out having a cigarette just staring at it and then it just took off. No reason for it to be there, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night to quiet street. Right. We appreciate you sharing with us, Michael. I mean, like I said, the video is amazing. Thank you for taking the time and encouraged to speak out. Anything else from from the video you wanted to to relate while we're recording? If you want to know? Just ask, and yeah. I'll, if I if I can answer it, I'll answer it. But Excellent. like I said to you in the email when I first contacted you, these things that have been happening since I, I wanted, I made the video public. Well, I, I first offered it to you in the hopes that if everyone could see it, then these things would stop happening because a lot yep. of other things have happened. Like I've, I've been evicted from my home. A lot of other personal things that have just all happened since mm -hmm. I took the video. And my only reason I've, I've done this, if it wasn't for these things happening to me, no one would see the video. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking if these people didn't want me to show anybody, Whoever yeah. they are, I, I believe it's the government. I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but it's somebody who has the potential to get into my phone, get into my computer somehow, do damage to the engine of my car, the electronics of my car, without anyone being able to know what's wrong with it. So it's somebody in the know. And like I said, if I wanted, if I showed everybody then there's no reason for me, for them to continue what they're doing to me. And yep. that's the main reason that you have the video is that you can now publicize it and the onus is not on me anymore. Fingers crossed that that's what happens. That was the only thing that I could come up with to stop what's happening. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, Michael. Thanks, guys. Okay. Have anything to gain? I couldn't tell. Is he is he lying? Is he just some crazy person? I needed more help, right? So I contacted Ross Coltart. Ross Coltart is an award-winning journalist from Australia. I'll just read here. Ross Coltart, Australia, is an investigative journalist, most recently for Australian News and Current Affairs Program 60 Minutes on Channel 9. He was previously chief investigations reporter for the Sunday Night News Program. Coltart has won five prestigious walkie journalism awards including most coveted top award for australian journalism 
the Gold Walkley. He's done some pretty amazing stuff. Let's check this out. His broadcast television, investigative journalism, has also won the top broadcast award of Loggy. In 2010, his reinvestigation into the murder of two young Australian tourists by IRA ter terrorists 20 years earlier in 1990 revealed new evidence suggesting complicity in the attack by Irish Sinn Sin Féin boss Gary Adams. In 2008, he covered, uncovered one of the biggest ever medical scandals in Australia, the Butcher of Bega. It won Ross not only the gold Walkley, but also the Walkley for Best Investigative Report, an expose of cronyism and impropriety in Australian Aboriginal Legal Services, won Ross the 1996 Logie Award for Most Outstanding Public Achievement in Public Affairs. In 2002, Ross won the gold medal at the New York Film Festival for Best International Report with the renowned filmmaker Max Stahl for an investigation into how Indonesian and mil militia killers in East Timor had gone unpunished for their crimes. He's co-author of two best-selling books, Dead Man Running and Above the Law. He also has In Plain Sight. That's a best-selling book as well about UFOs. Ross Coltart, so happy to have his help, and he really brought just amazing professionalism to this case. He had a long chat discussion with Michael. He did his own public uh, sources investigation and had a chat interview. So let's go through Ross's notes after his interview with Michael. Okay, so this is the sanitized email. Again, I've gone through and changed all the names and dates and made the uh, the ages a little bit off. Okay. The idea is you can't identify Michael. And the point of that is now we can give more information. We can give more background information. Okay. On the other two events, the other two stories, we can release all of the data that we have, as long as it doesn't give away Michael's identity. And so I've gone to a lot of pain to make that happen. And so here is the email from Ross Coltart. Hi, Chris. Okay. I've had a very long phone chat with Michael and I have to say that I cannot find any good reason to disbelieve him. He took me through the three key incidences that define his UAP experiences. Number one, when he was a 10-year-old on a houseboat on the Mayall Lakes and saw a glowing sphere orb. Number two, when he was a 16-year-old in the same area, and he says he was taken onto a craft of some kind where he met seven-year-old Julie. And number three, the incident in December in 2022. So Julie is the woman that was with him during the sighting. She was asleep in the tent. A few observations. Michael's highly intelligent, a high-functioning autistic man of 50 years age, divorced, father of ex-children, one of whom is also severely autistic. I detect no guile or lying in his demeanor. I took him through certain key incidents multiple times, and his recall is precise. And he says he cannot remember when he cannot remember. Although I find him credible, I warn that it's always possible he's created this whole story to attract attention for some inexplicable reason. But I balance that with the fact that his autistic condition makes him fearful of crowds, and he has huge social anxiety. He told me he was shaking throughout our chat because he found it so difficult. He has nothing to gain by telling this story. And from the beginning, Ross has voice concerns that an anonymous witness may have something to hide. Okay, so why why is Michael wanting to be anonymous? Does maybe he just makes these things up? He has some issue where he makes up crazy uh, claims, UFO stories. Okay. Well, that being said. On the other hand, I talked with Ted Rowe, who's been investigating for 20 years, specifically in UFO encounters, and he says maintaining anonymity is the standard. Most people want to be anonymous. And you see after all the blowback on Twitter, et cetera, is you can understand, okay? These people, no matter what, it's not going to be good enough. You know, look at Gimbal, look at Nimitz. They just still, still can't believe any of the data, okay? So there's, there's always going to be issues. I can understand why he's anonymous. It would be invaluable to be able to speak to Julie to confirm whatever can be confirmed of his story, of Michael's story. And I agree. We still haven't talked to Julie. It would be amazing if you could please contact me or Ross Coltart and really just to check in and corroborate the story. That's all we're looking for at this time. His eldest child, at 21 years old, has seen UFOs, UAPs, and told his father once he was driving at night and saw a red light in front of the car. Michael did have the video on his phone still. We were able to get the metadata off it to show that the sighting of the craft, as recorded on the video, was 18 December 2022 at 1.17 a.m. Remember, originally he says 10 to 10.30 uh, in the actual interview, which is interesting. Is he incorrect or is that lost time? That's around three hours. You, always, you hear in abduction stories, there's often lost time. He had originally told me that he thought the incident took place in late November 2022, but the date on the video is 100% confirmation, unless he's hacked the data. So that is almost two weeks different data. So that is interesting. Late November, uh, mid-December. Yeah, that is a, a, a point. 
I drew him on his computer expertise and software knowledge, and it's clear he knows how to use a computer, but he's not a hacker with the capability to render a CGI video on a whole computer. If this is a fake, he had help. The phone does not give GPS coordinates, but I've asked him to try to find the area on a map, and he's going to do that. He described a location two or three hours drive north of St. George, which is deep in outback southwest Queensland near a town called Dirambandi. So I talked with Michael later on, and we nailed down the basic area is that Norindu area, place, you know, 50 kilometers north of Surat is kind of what he said. And that general area, it's out in the middle of nowhere. Basically, that is the outback, according to Ross. Prior to our chat, I confirmed with sources that he has criminal convictions, very minor ones. I was impressed that when I asked him about any criminal background, he volunteered these straight up and accurately, just with uh, minor drinking offenses. He told me he no longer drinks alcohol. He's had difficulty with the grog as a younger man. So Michael is adamant he was not drinking at the time. He hasn't drank in years uh, at the time of the sighting. The fact that he volunteered these embarrassing aspects of his criminal and social history actually supports his credibility, in my view. I've done a trawl of court records and public sources, and there's nothing that reflects adversely on Michael's credibility. So there's just a basic public sources uh, kind of background check. You mentioned he'd done IQ tests and scored 160, which I would believe is quite plausible. He's extremely intelligent, impressively so. We talk quantum physics and astrophysics. He has listened to all of your shows. Thank you, Michael. I don't know if this is relevant, but he admitted Julie's also autistic somewhere on the Asperger spectrum. I'm interested in this also based on my own research. In the incident that took place when he was 16, when he alleges he was taken onto a craft of some kind, he says he thinks the purpose of that was to have him meet Julie. He admits he does not make sense that Julie was not even born at the time he met her, 1986. He cannot explain why he knew the seven-year-old 1986 was Julie, but he says he just knew. He says she has a very distinctive face. So this is, and Michael has explained this, this was in his second actual experience when he was 16. His first experience in the Mayo Lakes, he's basically on a, on a houseboat on this uh, trip out in this general uh, vacation area in Australia. And a white orb basically comes up near him. He said it moved almost like a living being and then ended up going under the water and was moving under the water without any issue. So he relayed that in writing in, in uh, his first email to me. In a second event, he's when he's 16, he's again back in that Myall Lakes area, and he ends up being uh, abducted, essentially, passes out, wakes up on what he calls a craft. In this craft, he meets seven-year-old Julie. There's another girl on the craft while he's there. The interesting part is later on, years later, decades later in his life, he comes across what he knows immediately is Julie, and she says, do I know you from somewhere? And a you know, supposedly she corroborates the story. That's why we'd really like to talk to Julie to see if she can uh, corroborate this. And then that is a very interesting story indeed. I've asked him if Julie will speak to me or you, and he says she, he's tried to talk to her about it, but she's extremely adverse to talking about the incident. Every time he's raised the subject with her, she leaves the room and goes to her bedroom. She will not talk about it, he says. I don't detect evasion in the way he talks about this unwillingness on her part. He seems generally frustrated that she doesn't want to talk about it. He describes in his first meeting with the child, Julie, how she was sitting at a small table on the craft playing with a tablet look, looking device that had symbols on it. This was 1986, well before iPads or other computer tech. He says that whatever ever happened to her, it remains extremely traumatic for her to this day. She clearly can't or won't talk about it, but he's going to push her again to speak to you. I hope, I hope she does. He recalls how he and Julie were placed on metal tables on board the craft. An object with a pinkish light came out of the wall and it scanned both of them the length of their bodies. No one took their clothes off or examined them. They weren't scared. They were told, he claims, telepathically, that they would be safe and comfortable. He describes how when he asked where he was vocally, one of the humanoids, seven to eight feet tall, he claims, pointed to a wall and it revealed black space and stars. We went through the black four-wheel drive story, and he says it happened twice on the highway between X and X at night. He confirmed the vehicles had no registration plate. One pulled right in front of him and the other behind, and they tried to force him to stop. He says he drove his little Ford car out into the adjoining lane and sped ahead. He says one of the vehicles sped off in front of the other, pulled over. I don't know what to make of this incident, but he tells it convincingly. I took him through it multiple times during long chat, and he told it consistently. No deviation from detail. It sounds implausible, but he actually admitted to me that there were other cars in the road when it happened, and they just kept out of the way. Seems plausible, I guess. He conceded it's possible the drivers and vehicles were just local yokels having fun with him, but he says it happened twice, and for that reason, he thinks it's, it was targeted at him. This is unusual and does raise a doubt in my mind, but he is so adamant it happened. 
He says the only media contacted were three American TV networks, including NBC and ABC. They told him they weren't interested, he claims. The phone stuff, where his phone sent text to friends that he didn't send, is also weird. He could perhaps have been infected with a phone Trojan. In summary, from Ross Coltart, I cannot ever be definitive because I have not yet spoken to any family member or Julie, but I find him reasonably credible as a witness, despite his extraordinary story. I guess I can say I see no good reason to dismiss him as a liar. He's adamant he was not drinking the night of the sighting, and he tells a consistent account. The video should be forensically examined by for any edits, and I'd advise checking flight tracker software to see if there are any flights overflying at that time of night, at that time in December last year, but I doubt it. It's the middle of nowhere. Hope this is useful. Best wishes, Roscoe from Ross Coltart. It is definitely useful. Thank you so much for your professionalism and time, Ross. So that's as far as we are in the initial investigation, publishing the video. Uh, it's just an amazing video. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Please subscribe so you can keep up with the investigation. We have the Kiev investigation going on. We have uh, this with the UAP in Australia. So much exciting stuff going on. Come to our UAP Society Discord if you want to take part. I actually shared this video on the Discord almost six weeks ago. If you're on the Discord... You're going to get the first information, first hack at these things. That's where we can uh, actually start making some movement. I released the video early on Tuesday while I was editing these final points and sanitizing and got a lot of blowback from the community saying it's just a flashlight. Uh, I've, always, I've obviously been duped. And I would say um, if that's the case, then you know it's unfortunate. But I thought the video and the evidence... The interview was so compelling, compelling enough that I need to get it out. I wanted to get it out. I think the data is important. I haven't seen any other videos like that. If you can actually easily replicate that with a flashlight, then I'd be curious to see how that's done. Because if you point a flashlight at any, any normal sensor, at least any camera sensor, I don't think it's going to look like that. But again, people are very smart. They it can be faked. Obviously, this is a single source event, right? So... Could it be faked? Of course, it could be faked. Do I think it's faked? I don't think it is. I think this could be a legitimate UFO sighting, legitimate UFO video. It's an amazing video, and that's why I put it out there. So what do you guys think? We've taken the investigation as far as we can. We've worked on this for three months, and putting the data out there, this this is what we have. You know, What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. We'll have uh, more data out. I did get emails back from Boris Zilyev. So hoping to have updates on that coming soon. The channel runs solely on your involvement. So watching, liking, subscribing, all that stuff really helps. If you want to go further, you can support the channel at patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato, get backstage access, or you can buy one of the new t-shirts. We made new Lato Files merch. If you want to check that out, there's some uh, pretty fun merchandise in there. So again, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great day. Peace.